Well, happy Sabbath, even though it's not Sabbath here yet. And uh, so I welcome everyone to the study. We're going to begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath, for the time that we have to study, for the fellowship that we can have, the things that you teach us, and for your forgiveness and power in our lives and the truths that bring a conviction and a power. We're thankful, Lord, for each person searching out truths. We pray that you can send your angels and your Holy Spirit uh, to guard and to direct each person in their search for truth. We ask, Lord, that as we look into this topic this evening, that we can have an open mind and heart to be corrected and um, help us to learn new things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, again, good evening and uh, welcome everyone. Now, this study here is a continuation of our study on the presidents of the United States. And um, we're going to look again at some of Colin's arguments. So he did a presentation on Sabbath, uh, which I watched. I didn't watch the question and answer period. And I don't have his notes, but I do have the video, which I can easily just bring up and refer to. And it's going to have the diagrams in there uh, that we need to look at. Now, There was a few things that, so just in, in trying to say what my thoughts were about the study. So there was much that he presented that was very similar to what he presented before. There wasn't a lot of new information, more towards the latter part and a, and a few other arguments that he hadn't brought in. Now he still hasn't addressed um, any of the points that I've made, or at least um, the vast majority of the important points that, that we've made in our understanding, trying to understand Revelation 17 in relation to Daniel 3 and also to uh, Daniel chapter 11, the first few verses. Now, he did bring up some arguments about other parts of the book of Daniel. So that's where he began. And um, in front of you, you here see a chart that I have of these different lines. We're going to come to that later. Right now I want to go to Colin's study. So you're just going to see this in on YouTube. <clears throat> now he he goes to Daniel chapter 10 and and he deals with this argument that this is going to refer to the latter days. And of course we know the Daniel chapter 11 refers to the latter days. Now, what, what does the phrase latter days refer to? What does that include? Does the latter days just refer to our time? everybody can hear me I would say no it doesn't just refer to our time okay so what time would it refer to uh, the time of the time of Christ coming okay so the time of Christ coming what about Millerite history that too and and would it include everything in Daniel chapter 11 yes Okay, so we can see that the latter days is is a very broad term. Um, and for anybody living 
at the present time, whether that present time was in the past, they would see that those events that are being talked about in the book of Daniel refer to the latter days. That is, it refers to their time as those people are passing through that history. But we know it is particularly for our time in that we see that that's the culmination of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 11. So um, I'm just going to move ahead here. Now, we can see, of course, the latter days can refer to the time of the end in 1989, but it also can refer to the time of the end in 1798. And it can also refer to events uh, that are connected to the time of Christ. But he's going to take this and say that this, which Daniel chapter 11 is going to start with, is referring to our time. Now, the way that we do that, what's the principle in which we take Daniel chapter 11, verse 1, 2, and 3, and we apply them to our time? What's the principle that we're using? Because we're not just taking those verses and putting them into the future. What are we doing to get there? Anybody? Can you rephrase the question? Okay, so what's the principle that we're using to take Daniel 11, verse 1 and 3 and place it in our time? Line upon line. Okay, so line upon line is part of it. Is it also a repetition of history? That is, do we believe that history will be repeated? Oh, certainly. Yes. So, and in order to understand the history being repeated, that is, we don't just take the prophecy and apply it to our time directly. What do we first have to do? We have to revert back to possibly the first instance. Okay, so we look at how the prophecy was originally fulfilled? Yes. Okay. And and why is that important if we're going to make an application to our time? Because it is a guideline. Okay. So so it becomes a guideline. It becomes the line in which we compare our history to. So we can't just go back and take a prophecy and reinterpret it. So when we make an application of a prophecy, do we have to understand its original fulfillment? Absolutely. Okay. So, so we can't just interpret it differently than it was originally interpreted or originally fulfilled. I mean, maybe somebody interpreted it wrong. But we'd have to look at its fulfillment, and then we can see that as a template in which to compare uh, with the other histories. So we know that Ellen White talks about uh, some of the prophecies in the book of Daniel and says the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. Now, back in the 1980s, there was um, uh, Charles Wheeling, um, who was using that statement, but misapplying the statement. That is, he was saying, what Ellen White is saying is that these prophecies are going to be repeated. And what would be the difference in a prophecy being repeated and the history in connection with the prophecy being repeated? Or am I just uh, being a little picky? Can you see the question? Again? What's the difference from a prophecy being repeated and a history in connection with a prophecy being repeated. Are they the same thing or are they something different? They are different. 
Okay, so in what way are they different? How could we argue? So, so the history is one thing and the prophecy is another. The prophecy is very solid. Uh, it comes from the Bible. Mm -hmm. The history is of man. And uh, it can fit a certain history. You can fit slot into almost anywhere. You can do almost anything with with history. Whereas prophecy, it's, it's, it is what it is. Okay, so this is an important point. That is... When it comes to interpreting a prophecy, and we, we can look at something like futurism. So Adventists are historicists. That's not to have, having to do with, uh, you know, historical um, uh, interpretation or hermeneutic. We're historicists in that we understand that the prophecies in the Bible have their fulfillments in the past. And... Um, we're not looking at all of the prophecies in the Bible as just talking about the future. That is, we understand that they're grounded in the past, that these are fulfilled in the past, and that they that history is repeated. And that limits our ability to manipulate that prophecy. That is, we see the prophecy, we see its fulfillment, and and that that sort of solidifies the interpretation of that prophecy. We can't then take that prophecy and apply the symbols in some other way. We have we can look at the history of that prophecy and we can see the line that it has and, and we can compare it to other histories, but we can recognize that it has a fulfillment in a particular period of time. So as Seventh-day Adventists, we don't take the 2300 days and make multiple applications of the 2300 days. Now we can see that the 2300 days create symbols. We can look at the start of it, for instance, in 457 BC, and we can see that there is symbols in connection with its commencement, dates, spans of time, and that we can see those symbols again at the end in 1844. And then we can also see that that symbol of these dates and the spans of time can apply to some events in our history. But we don't have a secondary application. That is, we don't take the 2300 days and, and take the prophecy of the start of the 2300 days and try to apply it to some other point of time that starts the 2300 days and then have the true day of atonement being fulfilled but we do have symbols that come from the 2300 days and we're going to see some of these um, in another series that i'm going to be doing on on the great reset uh, the 2030 great reset we're going to see how these symbols apply but we can't just reapply the prophecy we have to look at the history and that history is the events that are tied with its fulfillment, both at the beginning of the 2300 days and the end of the 2300 days. So when we talk about the time of the end, for instance, being 1989, um, we also are recognizing that there is something in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, that the 1989 is not just a repeat of history, it is actually a direct fulfillment of prophecy, All right? So 1989 is not just that we are comparing it with 539 BC and five to 537 BC. And it's not just that we're looking at 1798 and that 1989 is just a repeat of it. The reason why the history is connected with a repeat of this history why, why our, our time is a repeat of this history has to do with um, the fact that these different times of the end are all tied together. Now, uh, we're, we're going to go through this a little bit more, but this to me is an extremely important point. It's one of the points we haven't really addressed in too much detail, 
But we need to recognize that 1989 is actually a direct fulfillment of prophecy, even though it contains a repeat of history. That is, it contains a parallel to the Millerite history. It contains a parallel to the history of the three decrees. But it also in itself is marked in scripture because that's Daniel 11 verse 40b. So we have these different times of the end, the time of the end for, for literal Israel in their period of darkness. And, and then we have this time of the end in 1798, which we recognize as the time of the end, but 1989 isn't just repeating that history. It's also a specific prophecy that points to that. So um, let, let's just go look at that again. Um, so Daniel 11, verse 40. And, and we're very familiar with this. But the time of the end, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. And, and this is important because at some point we're going to have to go back and redo a study on Daniel chapter 11. Because we now know there are things that we missed or details that we, we, we didn't understand their connection. And we now can know some things about Daniel 11 that we couldn't have known completely. And, and Jeff laid out um, in his study on um, Daniel 11 that he did, which is... Um, what was the title of that study that he did in back in 2020? Daniel's Last Vision. Yeah, Daniel's Last Vision. So that's the, in there he laid out some things that he saw that were quite profound, which at the time I couldn't fully understand. Um, and, and he marked a date that he recognized this, and that date was January 11th, uh, 2020 or right that is a daniel fontenot did a presentation and it was at that presentation that jeff understood that something had happened in our understanding of daniel chapter 11. and so we need to go back to daniel chapter 11 with what we've learned and understand some of these things so so there's still a lot of work uh cut out for us regarding Daniel chapter 11. But here when we look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, we know that we have this issue of the king of the south and the king of the north. And, and part of Colin's study has to do with recognizing or trying to recognize how we look at Raphi and Paneum in connection with that, that this history in a sense is repeated. Um, this time of the end language at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him so we know that 1798 and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots with horsemen and with many ships so we're looking at a period of time that is um if we're going to go to 1989 um that's a period of 191 years or something like that it's 1798, uh, so you're going to add two there, right? So it's a long period of time. Uh, if I did that right, yeah, 191 years. That's a long period of time between these the first part of this verse and the second part of this verse. But it's the only thing that makes sense. And we spent time looking at the pioneer view of this. That is, they were trying to fulfill the prophecy or to see the prophecy's fulfillment in the events that were happening in their day. And they had a, a view that was very similar to Uriah Smith's. That is, Uriah Smith was using the pioneer view, but there were some problems with it. And what were some of the problems with the pioneer view? So if, and they took the view that there was three different powers here. So when the king of the north of the south shall push at him, that's France. 
and the king of the north shall come against him. The him in both cases is France. The king of the south is Egypt, and the king of the north is Syria, or in this case, what we would call Turkey, right? So the, 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 the nation that had control of Syria. And, and that's how the pioneers understood it. Now, what was the problem with their interpretation? If anybody remembers those studies. Okay, were they mixing literal and spiritual? And, and, and one of the points that we noticed quite clearly is that we're, we're dealing with uh, the fact that there is a change. There is a cross, before the cross, literal, and after the cross, spiritual. Where is the cross in relationship to the king of the south and the king of the north? Why would the king of the south and the king of the north, why can they not be literally Egypt and Syria in 1798? That's after the cross. Okay, but which cross? Now, of course, we have the cross of Christ, but in the context of, of this prophecy, where is the cross? Where is the change from literal to spiritual? Where does it occur? I don't know if people remember this, but this point really struck me, so I remember it. Where do we have the change from paganism to papalism? Is it 508? Okay, so in that period from 508 to 538. So we could have had the king of the north and the king of the south. Um, and of course, there was no king of the south. So the king of the north was Rome, right? And Rome uh, had control of that area that used to be controlled by the king of the north. Correct? So in that whole history, we have the king of the north, which has won this battle, right? So pagan Rome becomes the king of the north. And it's going to be passing its characteristics to the papacy. So the papacy becomes the king of the north. So is that a change from literal to spiritual? Anybody not understand what I'm saying? I, I want to make make sure that people understand, because if you all understand, then most people watching this will understand. Okay, so people understand what's happening. So when we start to then, as Uriah Smith and as the pioneers do, to take Egypt and Syria and say that they must be the territories, they must be the same locations, they haven't recognized the spiritual change that happens when you have the papacy arise. So now the papacy is the king of the north. It can't be Turkey. It can't be Syria. It can't be the area that controls Syria. And the king of the south has to be the spiritual king of the south. Now, where do we get the spiritual king of the south from? Where in the Bible? And what, what's the principle? Anybody know the Bible verse? Okay, I'll give you a hint. It's in the book of Revelation.
and, and it's an important verse because what does Revelation 11, 8 symbolize? Well, Sodom and Egypt. Okay, so we have Sodom and Egypt. But we also have a symbol here, which when they were trying to interpret or understand, when they were trying to interpret and understand Daniel chapter 11, they were looking at the prophecy of Revelation 9. That is, they were looking at Islam, at what was happening with the Ottoman Empire. But you can see here, this verse ties us symbolically to that. That's August 11th, or the 11th of August, Revelation 11, 8. But we know that this is this period of time. But it says, their dead bodies shall lie in the street of a great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. So we know that this has to be talking about something that's spiritual and not literal. So we can't then take the, the literal Egypt and the literal Syria or the literal Sodom or any of these literal places, literal Babylon, and, and then make an application of them. We have to recognize that they are symbols. So is, is that point clear? Anybody have questions or comments on that? Yeah, I think it's clear enough. So when we look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, um, we know that this can't be referring to the king in Egypt or the king of the north being Syria or Turkey or the Ottoman Empire. But we look at these spiritually. The king of the south spiritually, Sodom and Egypt, is France. And we already understand that as Seventh-day Adventists. So that's not even something in dispute. And the king of the north has to be the papacy in this context. So the king of the south comes against the king of the north. That's 1798. And the king of the north comes against the king of the south. That's 1989. So this is actually a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, what it does is it allows us to take these other histories, that is, the history in connection with the start of the 2300 days, and to look at that history of the three decrees and recognize it creates a line, just like the three angels' messages in Millerite history, that ends the 2300 days. And we can see that that period, that time of the end in 1798, lines up with the period of time with the fall of Babylon. And, of course, the rise of Cyrus and the issuing of, of the first decree. So, so we've established that, that. That's part of how we came to understand Daniel 11, verses 1 to 3. So when we looked at this, we recognized that there was at the beginning of this prophecy, things that paralleled the end of this prophecy. So before we even got into Raphia and Paneum, we had lined up these times of the end. And we had done this in, in 2015. So we had lined up these times of the end. We started to understand the history of the three decrees that they're ending the, the, the three, four or seven times with these decrees, and that all three decrees were needed in order to commence the 2300 days. That is, you can't have a third without a first and a second. So the decree of Artaxerxes is dependent upon this history. And, and this is something we've, we've spent a lot of time studying. But we know now, if we're going to look at this history, and we're going to look at its repetition, we're repeating history. We're not going to take Daniel 11, verse 1 to 3, as a direct prophecy. We're going to look at the history in connection with this prophecy and recognize that it's repeated. And so since we could do it um, at, with Millerite history, we could also do it with these decrees. Now, there's going to be these kings, 
and and it's an interesting that there's going to be three that stand up yet three kings in persia are going to stand up right and the fourth so what is this three and the fourth what is this typical of three one combination so it's a three one combination and it's a it's a symbol of the three angels messages and the fourth correct mm -hmm. <clears throat> agreed okay so now we're going to have verse three so this is the one of the differences that we have that I have with what Colin has presented. And this goes back to when he first presented it on December 25th, and I had some questions regarding this. Now, we had a misunderstanding. He misunderstood my reason for asking the question. My, my, my reason for asking the question was I didn't understand how he could make an application of the mighty king being a king of Persia. That is, Persia represents the United States. Greece does not. And so he made an application that the mighty king has to be Trump. And, and to me, that would be, I thought he must be interpreting the original prophecy differently. It didn't make sense to me that you could just make that application because I understand you can't just take the prophecy and make an application of it. You can only take the history. Now, the way that he was doing that had to do with chapter three. So, and I'm, I'm not going to try to misrepresent him in any way, but I might not fully understand his argument. So it might be considered a misrepresentation, but I'm trying to understand it correctly. And what we have is this image of gold. And we know that this image is the Sunday law. It has the symbols of the Sunday law. It also has a 3-1 combination symbolism. And so you, have a, you have the king that stirs up Grisha, and then you have the mighty king. Right. So, yeah, so he's going to, well, he doesn't stir up Grisha. I keep, keep saying that. He stirs, stirs up all against the realm of Grisha. And I'm not sure why people keep saying he stirs up Grisha, because he doesn't. Again, There's, let's see. Against. Okay. He stirs yes, up all against the, yeah, so he's stirring up. That is, yeah, that's, that's Esther chapter one. That, that's what I meant, yeah. <laughs> so in Esther chapter one, uh, Xerxes is going to be stirring up all, that is his kingdom to have this battle against Greece, right? So that's the 127 provinces that all these different leaders that he's going to get involved. Um, now in Daniel chapter three, we're gonna have this Sunday law. And, and we know that the argument here is since this is the Sunday law, we can take the image of Daniel chapter two, which is Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, all these different aspects. And we can also take chapter three and Revelation 17, and then argue that since this is all Babylon, that is, it's gonna be gold all the way down to the feet, we can then make an application to Daniel chapter 11, that it's all Persia, or all the United States. So, so that's basically how I understand his argument. Now, there is some virtue in that. So I don't think that it's, it's a completely faulty argument. But it's how we make that application and how we take this history so that we can understand it correctly. So one of the things we see here is that we're going to have Persia defeated by Greece. And so in this line, in chapter two, it's not going to go through, um, you know, Artabanus and then Artaxerxes and then uh, the different people that follow him, Darius II, or, you know, there's different people that follow that. They're not going to go through all the kings and, and they're not going to even go through all seven kings. That is, we're going to get to Xerxes and then we're going to have Greece as the next thing that lines up. Now, we know that the fourth 
is also the fifth. Correct? That is, if we are going to go to this chart here, so we're just going to look at the top. We're going to see we have Darius the Mede. He's not a king of Persia. He's a Median king. And then Cyrus is going to be the first king of Persia. And then three are going to stand up. Cambyses, False Myrtus, Darius the first. And then the fourth is Xerxes. But as far as in the line of the kings of Persia, can we see that he's also the fifth? Okay. And we so where, does the, where does the mighty king come in? Well, that's what I'm saying, is the mighty king is not a king of Persia. He's going to be right. okay. later. So we're going to have all these yes. Persian kings all the way down through this history. You know, there's another Artaxerxes the second. Right, I agree with that, yeah. Artaxerxes the second, and then uh, Darius the second. I can't even remember all the different Persian kings, but there's a bunch of them. And then, and then Greece will come along. And you're pretty noisy there, Jeff, so I'm get, turning you off when you're not talking, but I appreciate your comments. So Okay, no problem. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so when we get there, we stop with this fifth. Now, can we say five are fallen? When yeah, I can see that. And then the one is, wouldn't that be Alexander the Great? Well, it's not actually Alexander the Great. It's going to be Greece because Alexander's still, you know, a couple hundred years away. Or almost, right? So, so we know then that, that there is this model here of the kings of Persia, that we're going to see a defeat of the fourth or the fifth, depending on how you're counting him. And, and then Greece is going to take over. And then at some point, there's going to be a change again. Now, there's going to be these other powers that come. Greece is followed by Rome. And we know Persia represents the United States. It's a two-horned power, church and state. There's the laws of the Medes and the Persians. That's the Constitution. There's lots of different parallels that we have. But when we're taking this history of these Persian kings, we lined it up with the history of our time of the end. So this is the time of the end in 539, 537. It's got two dates there because there's two periods of 70 years that end. And then we're going to line it up with Reagan and Bush. So Reagan is does not get a number. He's a zero because he's lined up with the median king. And even though he's tied with the time of the end, the time of the end actually happens in the period under Bush the first. And then it's going to be followed by Clinton, Bush the second, Obama, and then Trump is going to be the fourth lining up. He's the fifth, of course, but the fourth lining up with that prophecy of Xerxes. So what should we see? Should we see any significance in the, in the kings that follow? Are they to be numbered in... Is there is is the question I'm asking? Was the United States conquered by Greece on January 6, 2021? Yes, I would have to say yes. Yeah, and and we can see that there there's going to be a repeat of this King of the North, King of the South. But we and and we already understand that that's Raffi and Paneum, and so we can look at that history and we can say that the king of the south defeated the king of the north on January 6, 2021, and that's Raffia. It's not the only Raffia. Now, when we first started studying Raffia and Paneum, I had a hard time accepting that Raffia and Paneum could 
be more than just one event, that is, raffia would be one event in our history and not continually being repeated. But we see that it happens on different levels. So we also recognize November 9th as an internal raffia. But when we look at the raffia here, January 6, 2021, it's not the raffia we predicted, correct? Because if it is, we would have to argue that that was midnight, that that was July 21st, 1844. Right. Are we arguing that? Are we taking that position? Is anyone taking that position? You say that's part of raffia, not well, raffia of itself. But... It's a type of type of raffia, right? So yeah. It's typical within our line, but it's not the raffia we have been looking for, because that raffia is going to have Islam attached to it, is it not? Correct. Okay. True. That's true. And it's something future, and it's something connected in the line of the Levites. It's still future. But then we know that there's this paneum. And paneum is, so what's going to happen here is this history connected with Persia is going to become typical of a history that's going to unfold between um, Greece when it's divided. So in order to understand the connection of this history, we need to recognize that there is this Greece is going to be involved and Greece is going to produce a king of the north and the king of the south. So if we are if we are trying to say that Greece is just the king of the south. That doesn't really make any sense. It's not anything that we've understood in the past. So we can't just take this history and say. You know, Trump losing is just, you know, Rafia, because it's, the Rafia is still future. It's a battle that Greece has amongst itself, and, and it's going to lead somewhere. So my argument here is that we need to understand this history, and then we can make an application of it. Now, when we look at what is written in the Scripture of Truth, uh, the argument that was made there is that the Bible doesn't men mention Artabanus at all, and that Artaxerxes is not, is not connected in this prophecy. That is, Daniel chapter 11, Artaxerxes is not mentioned. We just go from Xerxes to Alexander the Great, which is Greece. So we know that as when we put this on a line, we have to understand that it's what's written in the scripture of truth, that there's a reason why Greece conquers Persia and, and, and why the globalists have to conquer the United States. But is there going to be a battle in the United States between the king of the north and the king of the south? That is, as the United States falls, can we see that there has to be a, a civil war, like you saw with Greece, that exists within the United States? But it's under Greece, not under Persia. Has anybody thought about that? You mean besides agreeing with it? <laughs> yes. I mean, we know that there's still more to come, that there's that there's a battle, a civil war going on in the United States. And we can compare this with the civil war back in, in the 1860s, right? And that civil war was between two different powers within the United States, the, the North and the South. And, and that we connected that to the history of the North and the South in Israel as well. Going back first to the dividing of the kingdom in 977, and then to the civil war that happened 
in 742. And, and we know that they're connected. We've connected them chronologically. We did this last week. And so when we're looking at these prophecies, we can't just take a prophecy and make an application. We have to understand the history, that all of this history in Daniel chapter 11 is showing us our history. So we're going to see that Persia illustrates our history, that Greece illustrates our history, that Rome illustrates our history. And what are those three different powers represented in the book of Revelation? What are those histories called? Persia represents the false prophet in this case, the United States, right? Right. Greece represents who? The dragon. The dragon power, the globalists, the ones who presently have control of the United States. And then Rome represents? The beast. Yeah, the beast, the papacy, right? So, so to me, in order to understand Daniel chapter 11, we have to take all of Daniel chapter 11 and recognize that each of these histories represent the same history. And, and we've already done that with Daniel chapter 11. That is, we can see that the, it keeps repeating different aspects of this history. So we could look at what had happened with um, the fall of Greece and its divisions and the battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, and we could place it in our history. And we, and we took specifically from that history um, the Battle of Raphi and the Battle of Panaeum. They become symbols. And then we can also see with Rome. This has to do with you know, the triumvirate and then the emperors, right? All of these things uh, become connected to our history, but they're being illustrated by Rome. So if we were just to take Persia and say we just need Persia to illustrate this, what would be the error we were making? And especially if we're going to take Greece and place it as part of this line of the Persian kings, that we're going to say it's all the United States, what, what would be the error we're making? If we're only going to consider Persia, mm -hmm. then we're going to ignore the progression. Okay. And, and the symbolism that happens with each of these powers would be thrown right out the window. And we know we have these four kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, right? That's the four world empires that we deal with in Daniel chapter two. And they're reiterated throughout the book of Daniel and also in the book of Revelation. So each of these become spiritually symbolic at the end of the world. That is, we don't look for literal Babylon or Iraq or anything like that as having to have a part in Bible prophecy. We don't look at literal Israel as having a part in Bible prophecy. We don't look at literal Greece or literal Rome. We look at spiritual Rome, which is also called Babylon. And we've looked at these connections. As Seventh-day Adventists, we should understand these things. So and I'm not saying that, that Colin is making this literal application in that direct way. But I am saying that he's not taking into account the symbolic nature of each of these lines of prophecy and how they're connected. So when we go back over Daniel chapter 11, we should be able to recognize that the kings of Persia have a role. The kings of Greece have a role, the emperors of Rome have a role, and then the papacy, spiritual Babylon, which harkens back to literal Babylon, it has a role. And the United States has a role. It fulfills the role of Israel, of the land of Israel. This is what this movement has been founded on. And this was part of the argument that Jeff had 
when uh, Parminder and Tess rose up against the foundation of the message, when they clung to um, the Time and the End magazine as a symbol, but rejected its content. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying here? What what I'm I'm trying to illustrate here. I'm not, I'm not trying to compare like Colin to Parminder and Tess or anything like that. What is it? What is it that we should be able to see? When we look at Daniel chapter eleven, we should be able to see everything that's in the Time of the End magazine our understanding of that history dealing with the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Yeah, all of these points should become prevalent. Right. So when we try to take what's happening now and make it the Sunday law, that the Sunday law is coming, and and I understand, you know, the Sunday law is coming, but there are things that have to occur. And, and the parallel that, that I saw, which we saw when we went through early writings, page 74, is we could see that we were in that same time and that there's that same inclination. There it was time setting, you know, having to do with, November 1851, seven years after um, 1844, that Christ would then return. That his people wanted to see that the prophecies, the predictions that they had made were going to be fulfilled. But it was quite clear that they weren't prepared to give that message to the world and that the message that they were giving was counterproductive to the work that God was showing needed to be done. And I believe we're in that same situation today. That what's going on in this movement is counterproductive to one is it's going against what God has been showing us, what our mistake was. And it's also inhibiting this movement from accomplishing its work. So remember, Jesus could have come back in 1863 in that history, but he didn't because the church didn't do its work. And so we can look at our line and we can look at what we should have accomplished. We haven't accomplished it. And it's going to take time, especially if this movement can't work together. That is, if we're not doing the work that God has told us, if we believe we have a message when we don't, and especially when we have no ability to give that message. We're not really doing anything to give that message. Then, then we're going to just be inhibiting what God wants to do. And that's, that's my major concern regarding what's happening. I think it's fine to study these things. So when Colin does, does his presentations, I don't think that's wrong. I don't, you know, I wouldn't argue that you know, Collins in some kind of apostasy against the truth. I would say we need to look at these things. We need to examine them because I believe there are things that Colin has been given that he doesn't yet see that based upon what we have studied, some of these things fit and we need to take them into consideration. And the same with Odilio's presentations. There's some things that fit, some things that don't. And, and it's mostly just the interpretation. The lines are correct. It's how we understand them. So, so if we're going to look at this history here, and we're going to look at Collins' line, so he's going to have Trump, Biden is the seventh, Trump is the eighth. So we talked about this before. So he's counting Reagan as one. And we can see that we don't do that in this line. So so that to me is 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 a problem with this count. 
Um, and, and I would see that Trump is the fifth because he's Xerxes. So then we could say five are fallen. One is. Now, we're not going to say the one is necessarily is Artabanus because that really doesn't follow. That is, when we take this line of Xerxes here, we can, we can show that these illustrate the seven thunders, the seven kings, etc. But we know that there is now this transition that occurs. After Xerxes, Greece arises. And Greece is going to then illustrate again the same history in a different way. And then Rome is going to arise, and it's going to demonstrate the same history, but in a different way. Can we see that that's how it has to be? So I'm, I'm arguing that we can't use Alexander the Great as a reference to Trump. Now, I know that Jeff did back in 2016 when I was at the School of the Prophets. And, and that is, he was focused again upon the Sunday law. And it seemed to us, based on everything that he had studied before, that when Trump was going to come into power, this was going to be this religious right that had supported Trump and brought him into power, that was then going to exercise that religious right idea of the Sunday law. But Trump had no interest in that. That is, Trump didn't fulfill that role. And we're arguing, well, he's going to fulfill that role now when he comes in again. What would be the problem with that? So we're going to look at the prophetic problems, but just the problem with, with that just as an idea, that Trump is then, the next time he comes into power, is going to bring in the Sunday law. What, what's the problem? You know, ignore the fact that, you know, we don't believe that Trump can be elected again, that there's any interest in it or enough interest in it that he could become the president of the United States. There isn't the political will, even though there might be, the people might have that will, but I don't think they do. I think some do. Um, but if Trump came back into power, what would be the problem? Is Trump going to act differently than he did before? Would Trump that would, go? That's all. That would be akin to a leopard changing their spots. Right. And because we know, now we know, based on Trump's history, he had no interest in being a dictator. He had no interest in going against the Constitution. He's a constitutionalist who believes in the United States and came into power to save the United States. That's his belief. He's not going to do something that's going to destroy the United States. So even if he came into power, he's not going to act differently than he did before. You know, the fox and the scorpion going across the water. The scorpion's going to kill the fox. So question. Yeah. Do you think it's possible the circumstances could change that would bring about a change in him? I, I can't foresee what that could possibly be. Because as much as, you know, Trump, we, we look at him as the sort of um, immoral person. He's actually highly principled, just not in the things that we would be principled in. So his belief in individual would not allow him to bring in a Sunday law. But that's beside all of the prophetic evidence. I'm just saying that it doesn't make sense. But the other thing that we're looking at from a pro prophetic viewpoint is we have no example of this. In all of the, the sevens with an eight, we don't see the same person 
being the eighth. It's, it's not one of the seven. The eighth is of the seven. And we illustrated that with uh, the kings of Judah and Israel, right? So Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah. And then you're going to see Christ is the eighth. He's the rightful king. And it's going to be this period of this overturning, overturning, overturning until he come whose right it is. Now, this is also important into this prophecy as well in, in a number of ways. So one is we can see that Babylon's going to conquer Jerusalem. And then it's going to be overturned to Greece or to meet Persia. And then it's going to be overturned to Greece. And then it's going to be overturned to Rome. And then in the time of Rome, Christ comes. And, and he comes twice. I mean, he comes at the time of the Roman Empire at the beginning. And then he's also going to come at the end of the world. And he doesn't take up his throne when he comes the first time. Though he does have the right to that throne. But he's waiting because there is a history that has to unfold. So, so Christ is going to come again and take his rightful place, but it's still going to be in the time of Rome. Because one of the things we recognize is that Rome is the last kingdom. There is no other kingdom. We still live in the time of Rome. <clears throat> now, we're not going to be able to go into it today, but... We do want to go into Daniel chapter 11 and look at some of the, the arguments that um, Colin used. And that is, he looked at other histories of the king of the north and the king of the south in the time of Greece. And, and I, I don't think I fully understood how he came to his conclusion. But one of the things that he did in making an application is he argued that... Uh, Trump is the king of the north and Biden is the king of the south. What would be the problem with doing that? Now he's trying to use the history of Greece to do that. Yep. Yeah. He's basically <clears throat> having the king of the north and the king of the south be being elements of one nation. Okay, well, the king of the north and the king of the south are elements of one nation when it came to Greece. That is, it was the dividing of the Grecian Empire. We have the king of the north and the king of the south. They are part of one nation, but they're part of Greece. But in, in this situation, the way that Colin was presenting it, he was placing Trump, who is a non-globalist, as the king of the north and Biden, who is controlled by the globalists as the king of the south. Right. Now, so one is, to me, the problem would be is just taking the individual. Because if we ever made an individual the king of the north. No. We, right. We never have. That I, that I see in all of our understandings of the king of the north and the king of the south. We had France as the king of the south right we have the papacy as the king of the north and sure there are leaders of these kingdoms but they're at different times there's different leaders and so the king of the south is not an individual and we know that the king of the south moved from france to the ussr and now has moved to the United Nations, it becomes the dragon power. And, and it's the globalists, right? And they have conquered the United States. Biden is, is a puppet. I mean, he can hardly speak, he can hardly, well, definitely if he doesn't have a teleprompter, he can't make any sense. He even has trouble with the teleprompter. He's not making the decisions in the United States right now. So he, he can't be the king of the south. So you can't have an individual. Now, there are some other points that he's going to bring up that we're going to address as well, because there were some interesting things that Colin did that need to be 
discussed, but we're just not going to have the time. I do want to finish uh, here a little later. I, like, I don't want to go too late, just like 15 minutes or so. Now, when we look at this, we have these the Jewish kings at, at the bottom. We have then here this history. Now, this is not really Colin study. This is Odilio's. But this was also a problem. That is, um, this history of these 10 kings, um, and, and I'm counting them from Augustus to Titus. Now, we know that Jerusalem falls. The temple is destroyed under Vespasian. And, and I've hemmed and hawed a little bit about that. I mean, I've, because we have Caesar Augustus. Why am I putting Caesar Augustus as the first and not Julius Caesar? The, the ones that you're using are the rulers of the Roman Empire. Yeah, but that's not the main reason why I'm not putting Julius Caesar. Okay. The main reason would be, if this is a parallel, is this not the time of the end in the time of Christ? And that Christ is born in the time of, um, that that time of the end happens in the time of Caesar Augustus. He's born, marking the time of the end, and also we have John the Baptist at the time of the end too. So. I couldn't put it back to Julius Caesar because that's not the time of the end. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Now, you know, somebody could argue that Julius Caesar is maybe like a zero. Okay, so, you know, you could argue that, but you can't make him a one. You could say that there's some connection with what Julius Caesar does that leads to this time of the end, but you definitely can't put Julius Caesar at the time of the end. It's only Augustus. So the fact that we have 10 emperors here. Now, when I do this, Titus is, of course, the 10th, but he's the one who conquers Jerusalem. He's the one who destroys the temple. I'm sure, he does it under Vespasian. But why, can I, why do I include him here? Why do I have 10? Anybody remember our study of why I did this? Is this typical of the ten kingdoms that are going to then exist? Yes. Okay. So we can see we need the ten. And Titus, even though he's not emperor when he destroys the temple, he's still there. And so I'm taking this as a type. Now, when we looked at the pioneers understanding of the seven heads and, and we didn't dwell on this one too much but because we kind of got caught up in the seven heads but they were the seven forms of roman government but i was arguing that these 10 kings are the 10 horns on the seven heads of revelation 12. and does that make sense to anybody or does that not make sense to people I think you're making a valid point. Okay. So if they are the seven horns or the seven horns, they can't be the seven heads. Which was Odilio's argument. But there is something about the fact that they can represent to some degree the presidents of the United States, because we've already done that, and the kings of Judah, and um, the Persian hi history, as well as the, the last seven kings of Israel, etc., that we can take seven of these and line them up. And, and we're going to look at this in more detail later, but I just wanted to address all of these lines here. So why can I take the seven 
hit the seven horns, which are not the seven heads, but why can I make that parallel? Why can I do this? Why can we take the Roman emperors and line them up with, with our history? And, and the idea there is we're going to take Nero and we're going to line him up with Trump. Can we do that? Because this is the main argument of Odilio, and I believe that we can, but why can we do that? When does Nero reign from? What's the period of his reign? I don't know if you can see that. Depends what device you're looking at. From 54 to 61, isn't it? Or 68? Yeah, 64 to 68. But notice it's October 13th and June 9th. Now, this is a mirror of something in our history. From June 9th to October 13th, 2018, is a period of 126 days that that we experienced in connection with time setting, right? Notice this is in reverse. It starts with October 13th and ends with June 9th. Of course, a different year, but still those two symbols are there. Also, the burning of Rome occurred on what date? July 18th, 64. Yeah, so July 18th in 50, wasn't I it? Thought it was, I thought it was 64. 64, yeah, in 64, right. Um, so July 18th, AD 64. And, and so we have these symbols that tie Nero to the time of Trump, to the symbols that happen in our history in connection with Trump. So Nero is the fifth, so Trump must be the fifth. Does that make sense? It's logical. But do we have see any significance in Galba, Otho, and Vitellius? These are people who are briefly emperors and really don't get complete control of the empire. Could this be representing something in our history that we haven't understood yet? It could. Yeah. Now I have their June 8th, but you know, it could be June 9th. It's just how the whole thing works out. But um, because Galva sort of takes over and then Nero kills himself. But we also have this April 9th date, April 19th date, I mean, with Vitellius which, and then we're gonna have Vespasian, and Vespasian is the emperor during the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. So I think this might represent something, some weak powers in our history that we haven't foreseen, whatever that means. We haven't studied this history that much. And so I wouldn't discount it and just say it's, it's a nothing history, especially since we're gonna have something that parallels our time the destruction of Jerusalem. <clears throat> so hopefully that's been helpful for people studying this. Again, I don't have all the answers to every question. And, and I'm not just trying to attack Colin's argument and saying it's weak, because I'm actually trying to present what I think are, are his main arguments. But we have to address these problems, that is, if we're going to follow Miller's rules, we have to look at everything. And we have to have it all fit. And, and I, I do have a problem with the application of taking Alexander the Great and making him part of the United States, that he's symbolizing something in the United States following Trump. Well, so he's going to be Trump. So you're going to have Trump and then Trump, without Biden mentioned, but I don't see that. I see that now we have this new illustration under Greece that's going to go for this history. And, and so we know that there is this 
battled between the King of the North and the King of the South in 1989. And that's going to be illustrated again in Greek history in a number of ways, a number of different battles between the King of the North and the King of the South. But it's going to be the one that finally ends the King of the South, Paneum, that's going to be the most significant, along with Raphia, the one that precedes it. So, any questions? Just a lot to think about right now. Is it clearer to people? Is anybody getting, is it more muddy to people what we presented here this evening? Or does it help clarify points? I'd like to hear from somebody who feels it's muddier. I think um, even though it's Biden that's in, it's actually the UN. Right. Mm -hmm. So whoever comes in in eighth, it might be not, it might, he might be the president, but there's not him running it, right? Yes. Yeah, so it would be a power, not a person. Right. So, I mean, my view is that what we're going to see. But he would still be the president, whoever is in. Just like Biden, well, it Biden's there, but he's not—he's not really running the show. Well, can can the globalists lose the United States to the Republicans, even if they still have Biden in power? Do we need do we need a president? to be put into power in order for the king of the north to defeat the king of the south. That is, couldn't it just be that the king of the south is defeated in this midterm election? Okay, so Iran says there's three legs. So he's talking about the judiciary. Well, there's, what, what are your three legs? How are you going to describe that? Are you saying three branches? Yeah, I, I think he means three branches, but can you explain that, Iran? Okay, so yes. So what are the three branches of gover government? They are executive, legislative, and judicial. Yeah, right. So you've got those three, yeah, administrative, judicial, and legislative. Executive branch is the president. president. Right. Legislative branch is both of the houses of Congress, right? Correct. And, and then the judicial, of course, is uh, the Supreme Court. Right. And in a sense, all the other courts under it that are connected to it, but mostly the Supreme Court we think of as the judicial branch of the federal government. So, um, and there may be something to that that we haven't considered, um, especially when we deal with with this civil war going on in the United States. So I think there's still more to understand. I do think that the Republicans are going to win the midterms hugely. And this is going to be a big blow to the Democrats because the Democrats have moved foolishly. That is, they've acted in what I would consider a very short-sighted way. I, I don't I don't understand that just the idea of getting rid of Trump was going to solve all their problems. Because, you know, time goes on. It, you know, if all you're thinking about is right now, putting Biden in power was a, was maybe the only thing that they could do. But that's not going to stop the problems that exist in the Democratic Party the divisions that exist there. Um, and that's why I don't believe that the Republicans are that short-sighted, that they would risk the future by putting Trump into power now, because everything to them doesn't weigh upon the now. Sure, you can have this, this time in which the Democrats are in power, but you don't need Trump. You just need, down the road, to establish your footing so that you can then get into power as the Republican Party. 
and maintain your popularity. Getting Trump into power would be basically political suicide. It would be very short-sighted, just like the Democrats. Now, maybe the Republicans are just as stupid as Democrats, but I don't think so. Basically, it's been well proven that when it comes to logic, the Democrats are not very logical. So, so there's still things that we're going to have to answer, but I, I do think that what Colin has presented is a piece of the puzzle. It's just that we can't interpret it in the way that he does, and we can't make it that immediate. That is, there are things that have to unfold prophetically that we have to take into account. And you know, maybe this study at some point will change into a study on Daniel chapter 11 in a more organized fashion instead of addressing just these points. So any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay. No. Okay, well, let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath, for the fellowship of your spirit. We can connect with you and thus be united with one another. We ask, Lord, that we can demonstrate your character to all, whether we disagree or agree. Um, we pray, Lord, that... Um, you can give us the patience that we need to learn in the school of Christ. Help us to trust in you. Be with each person watching these studies, and we ask, Lord, for your continued care and protection and your continued leading. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.